Viewer discretion is advised. In my career as a sheriff's deputy, I've seen and done more than my fair share of traumatising and disturbing things. Of course, I've never really been able to share my experiences with many people other than my wife and a few members of the force. But now that I'm retired, I've decided to share the ones that have stuck with me the most over the years. And this was just one day on the job. It wasn't a call that we weren't expecting. It wasn't something that came out of the blue at all. In fact, most of us had been itching to take care of this issue for months, but we had been forced to wait for a warrant. There was this abandoned house in one of our neighbourhoods that we would patrol. The owners of the house died and they didn't leave the property to anyone. It was foreclosed by the bank, who didn't touch it for far too long, until they'd finally decided to mark it for demolition, when it had gotten to the point that it was about to fall over on its own. We got the warrant for the raid based on the testimony of a contractor who went inside the house for a pre-demo inspection and came running to the station looking like he'd seen a ghost. From what the inspector said, we all had the same idea of what we were getting into. On the surface, it was obviously your typical trap house. We'd expected to find all sorts of drugs, squatters and illegal firearms, which of course we did. So we came prepared to make arrests. However, we could have never been ready for the extent of what we discovered. We circled the house with about eight squad cars, plus a SWAT van from the next county over. It was the middle of the day, but none of the occupants even noticed what was happening outside. I wasn't on the front line, but I was several men behind the SWAT line who announced our presence at the door before breaking it down. We only gave them about 15 seconds warning, from the first shout to the door being rammed open, but that was enough time for several of the occupants to get up and scramble for the back door. We, of course, had officers waiting to capture them. The SWAT guys charged in and they scared any of the rest of them from even thinking about putting up a fight. By the time I got in there, there were about a dozen people left on the first floor of the house and they were all on the ground. However, it wasn't time for me to start cuffing them and getting them out of there. Mobilising them with zip ties was the job of the officers who came in behind me because even though the ground floor was secure, the rest of the house wasn't clear yet. There was the basement. While the other guys cleaned up the first floor, I backed up the SWAT team with another deputy, which was my partner at the time. As the armoured men continued their march, heading down the stairs into the space below the house, I remember my heart was racing the whole time, like it would on any other high-intensity raid like that. I could feel the sweat soaking through my clothes, and it was like I could see a 360 degree all around me. But there was a distinct change in the air as I made my way down those steps, and the SWAT team felt it too. They slowed their pace noticeably as we descended. The hairs on the back of my neck stood straight up, and I noticed the eerie quietness of the space I was entering, broken only by the noise from upstairs. I was overcome by a smell too, a stench, really. It was so distinct, but I didn't really want to admit I knew exactly what it was. For a moment, it was pushed out of my mind. The SWAT team started shouting at somebody, and I realised that there was a man trying to escape the basement through one of those egress windows, but he was too overweight to fit through quick enough. Before he could get his midsection unstuck, I ran up and, with the help of my partner, yanked him down by the feet, sending him crashing to the floor where we immediately tied his hands and feet together, as per protocol. After a few more seconds, the tentative, all clear, was given. It was time to begin the investigation. And at that time, I was already trying to distract myself from what I already knew by griping with my partner about having to eventually get the fat guy we just arrested up the stairs. But he didn't even have time to respond to me. Off to the side, one of the SWAT members started going ballistic, shouting and cussing and all of a sudden started running over to the immobilised man and picked him up by the collar, screaming into his face. What the hell is wrong with you? He growled, almost as if he was going to cry. But the fat guy didn't even respond. My partner and I were stunned for a critical few seconds and didn't move to do anything. I knew we were both thinking, what could possibly get a guy like that, a guy who might as well be a trained soldier to behave like that. Then the fat man, with the blood pouring from his nose from face planting the ground during the, his arrest, <laughs> spat in the SWAT member's face and in an instant the SWAT member lashed out and shook the man in the head with the butt of his rifle, effectively disabling him completely. I'm positive he would have kept on going and beating him to death too if it wasn't for the rest of the SWAT team rushing over and pulling him off. By then I was starting to feel an uneasy shakiness in my knees and I knew that soon I would have to accept the truth of what triggered that man's rage. That stench I noticed earlier, I had recently become quite familiar with. My first son had just been born a few months prior, and the odour of infant faecal matter is quite recognisable. 
SWAT escorted their unhinged comrade upstairs and left me alone with my partner and the fat guy who he had arrested. And all of a sudden, all of our surroundings came into focus. All around us were cribs, six of them, lined up against the wall of the dark and cramped, dingy basement. In horror, we looked into them, and what we saw has given me nightmares ever since. There were children in each of the cribs, more than one child in some of the cribs, ranging from infants to toddlers. They were all in terrible distress and covered in feces. The reason we hadn't heard them crying in the chaos of the raid was because they were all, every single one of them, gagged by pacifiers, which were held in place over their mouths by cordage that was wrapped so tightly it was digging into the skin in some cases. Some of the children were tied up with bungee cords. I immediately felt so lightheaded that I almost couldn't continue standing. I wanted to believe so badly that what I was seeing couldn't be reality. I vaguely heard my partner call out for backup, but I forgot to do my job. All I could think to do was pick up a baby that was squirming so helplessly in front of me and take out their pacifier so they could finally cry through their immense suffering. I cradled them in my arms and tried to console them, and this was the sight and sound that so many of my colleagues witnessed when they came rushing down the stairs. Through the investigation, it was found that many of the drug addicts squatting in the house had formed a twisted, neglectful daycare centre for their unwanted kids so that they could get high in peace. All the children were put into the foster care system, and none of us saw any of them ever again. But I know for a fact that each of us has wondered about their fate every day since. I know, I have. When I was in the third grade, maybe around eight or nine years old, I saw something that completely traumatised me, and I still can't figure out if it was real, or if something has replaced my entire family, or if I suffered some type of psychotic break, because I can swear that this truly happened. It was the day after Thanksgiving. I went upstairs for breakfast, not even noticing that my sister wasn't asleep in her bed. I got myself a bowl of cereal and sat at the table. No one was there, but usually my house was always full. I lived with my aunt and two cousins, as well as my parents and other two siblings, and usually mornings were loud. Parents shouting at us to get up and get ready for school, shower, just laughing and screaming as we played, if it wasn't a school day. It was never quiet. That morning, there was none of that. It was absolutely silent. Maybe that day is the day that makes me anxious to be in silence. I have to put music on, or TV shows I've already seen, something that won't distract me too much in order to sleep. Otherwise my mind races and my heartbeat speeds up and I begin to panic. I don't know why I felt the need to open that door. I rarely went in that closet. It only held blankets and sheets that weren't in use. I never should have opened that godforsaken door. My life has never been the same since. I looked around for my family after realising that it shouldn't be this quiet in the house. My aunts and cousins were gone. Everyone was just gone. Every room in my house was empty until I walked past the closet and something was telling me to open it. Only the closet door would not budge. I pulled and I pulled to no avail. I was just about to accept that and walk away, but <laughs> the door clicked. I pulled the door open and I screamed until my throat gave way and my voice abandoned me. Staring back at me was my father in one of those bags that they put wedding dresses and suits in, just hanging there on that hanger. I can't even begin to explain how that hanger could hold his weight without giving it away. There were other bags, so reluctantly I moved them to the side, and my parents, and my brother, and my sister, and my aunt, my two cousins, all of them were there. They were there and undeniably dead. I tried to scream again, forgetting that my voice had already left me like they had. All of them just gone. I called the cops, and of course, they told me that they would send someone over, but no one ever showed up. I began calling my other family members. It all ended the same way. They would panic, telling me to stay put until they got there and that they were calling the cops. And again, the cops never came. My family did, my family did though. Each and every one of them became dead bodies hanging in bags in the closet. How they got there, I had no idea. The closet wasn't even big enough for all of them to be in there, yet there they were. Every one of my family members were dead, at least the ones whose numbers were saved on the home phone anyway. My family was gone. I had no way to reach the ones who weren't, and even if I did... Why would I? They all ended up dead after being called. The cops still didn't come. Why didn't they come after I told them my family was dead? I laid on the couch and cried in silence. Nothing but the sound of my uneven breaths and sniffles until I cried myself to sleep. I woke up the next day, my head pounding, but my ears filled with the normal ruckus in my house. Everyone was back, alive, and as loud as ever. 
I told my mum everything and she insisted that it was just a nightmare, even calling my extended family to prove that they were too alive, and very well. I would have believed that except my eyes were puffy and my head was pounding f as it always is when I cry myself to sleep at night. My throat hurt, presumably from the screaming. Not only that, but it was Saturday. If it was just a nightmare, wouldn't it be Friday, since that's what the day was in my nightmare? If it was Saturday, why didn't I have any memory of that day aside from the supposed nightmare? The icing on the cake were the bags in the closet, neatly folded on the floor. I asked my mother about them and she said that they'd always been there. They were not, and even if they were, they, we definitely would not have had that many. My mother has changed since that day. She's mean to me, to everybody. I can't look at all my family the same way after seeing all of their dead faces hanging in that closet. My life has not and will never be the same until I get to the bottom of this. Am I insane? Or did something replace my family? Why didn't they take me too? Just for context, I am male in this story. This happened in the beginning of July two years ago. My girlfriend and I lived right outside this little beach town bordering the Atlantic. It's about a 30 minute drive to the beach and we've both spent a lot of time hanging out there. A couple of days before the 4th of July, we found out that they were having a fireworks show on the ocean. So we made a last minute decision to drive out there and watch them. This beach town isn't really a popular tourist area since it's been developed for some time now. With houses and small businesses, pretty much everyone in that town lives there and I think they only have one hotel. We knew that the public portion of the beach would be so packed that we decided to try and find a more secluded area. Not too long after looking, we found a smaller neighbourhood that seemed to be pretty close to the beach. I used the car's GPS to navigate us as close to the beach as possible through the neighbourhood. After some time, we turned onto a cul-de-sac that stretched a short way down the road before reaching the houses at the end. In between the two houses was a service road that looked like it led straight to the beach. I parked my car and got out, carrying a blanket and some water bottles and a few snacks despite reading the sign that said, Do not enter. We ducked under the metal fencing and went straight in. We made our way down the large dirt path that led through a patch of woods behind the houses right to the beach there was absolutely no one there and we'd have a perfect view of the fireworks when they started at 10. we rolled out the blanket and sat down just taking in the relaxing aura of the ocean the fireworks started a few minutes after so my attention was completely focused on that almost preventing me from noticing the man walking along the beach in our direction it was coming from the direction of the public beach so it didn't strike me as odd or strange or anything out of the ordinary as he got closer i was able to see that he was wearing khakis but the bottom portion hiked up as though not to get water on them he had on a gray shirt and didn't seem to have on any shoes or socks which fully gave me the impression that he was just taking a walk once he was directly in front of us he slowed down his pace and kept looking over at my girlfriend and she definitely took notice of this and was clearly creeped out by him it felt like it took him forever to pass, but once he did, we both agreed that he seemed really weird. Once he was out of our vicinity, we turned back to watch the fireworks, which had already been going on for about 20 minutes at this point. The finale started shortly after, which made it almost impossible to hear anything else. Once it ended, we rolled up the blanket and we turned to head back down the path towards the car. As soon as we started walking, my girlfriend stopped and pointed to the path in the woods. The same guy was standing there just staring at us. We both awkwardly stood there for a few seconds until I yelled out to him, Can I help you? He didn't give any response but rather just turned around and started walking down the path. He was going in the direction of our car so we had no choice but to follow him. My girlfriend was pretty scared and I admittedly I was too. I didn't really know what he was doing but it was concerning that he clearly had an interest in my girlfriend from our first encounter. I led the way while my girlfriend stayed closely behind me. The path turned to the left, so once the guy made it there, he disappeared out of view, having no idea where he was until we made that turn ourselves. I felt myself tensing up as we got closer, and as soon as we rounded the bend, I was in view of my car, but the guy was nowhere to be seen. Suddenly, I heard some leaves rustling around in the woods, followed by my girlfriend screaming at the top of her lungs. I turned around to see that the guy had tackled my girlfriend to the ground and he was on top of her, repeatedly punching her in the face. My adrenaline completely took over and without hesitation I dove on top of him and pretty much beat the crap out of him. My girlfriend was bleeding from her nose pretty badly but she was able to call the police while I held him down. 
He was unconscious for the most part, but he didn't try to fight back once he woke up. When the police arrived, they immediately took the guy away in handcuffs while we got a ticket for trespassing. My girlfriend's nose was completely broken, which had to be set back in place that same night at the hospital. The guy had no prior criminal record and lived a seemingly normal life as a grocery store worker before this. When asked why he attacked my girlfriend, he couldn't give an explanation. He was even determined to be sane and in his right mind on the night of the attack. It's crazy to think that, that our seemingly perfect night turned into a living nightmare in the span of just seconds. He's still in jail and will be for the next six years, but I'm just worried about what he'll do when he gets out.